Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to Grand Rounds today. Uh, please remember to uh, sign the attendance record at the back of the auditorium and also uh, please remember to fill out the program evaluations and most importantly, give the CME committee any ideas that you might have in regards to future topics or future speakers. Uh, today we actually have a trio of speakers. Uh, they are Sue Sandall, who is an occupational therapist. Courtney Huber is a speech therapist and Gail McGehee, who is a physical therapist and they are uh, all from On With Life in Ankeny and they have kindly accepted our invitation today to come uh, up and provide us with an overview of the LSVT Big and Loud program and uh, please join me in welcoming them. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, I'm Gail McGahey, PT, um, as uh, he said. Thank you very much for having us here. We're here to talk about Parkinson's, but also more of the LSVT Big and Loud program. Uh, what's exciting for us is that this is a program that we're super, super passionate about at On With Life. Um, we've been fortunate enough that we have actually been targeting um, working with individuals with Parkinson's since 2013. Uh, we started that by doing the uh, Big and Loud program. Since since then, the program continues to evolve. Um, it used to be just big and loud, but now it's evolved to be much more comprehensive, all the way from early stages of diagnosis to uh, late end stages of diagnosis as well. So thank you for having us. Just from an, an audience standpoint, who are the, my physicians? If you could raise your hand so I know who we're talking to. Thank you. How about therapists, PTOT speech? Hi, fellow people. Okay. How about nurses? Hi, guys. Hello. And then I guess we'll say others. Hi, others. OK. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so we're here to talk about Parkinson's. We're here to talk about um, living your best life with Parkinson's. Uh, the font is goofy, so it changed a little bit on the presentation from what we had submitted. So kind of cool looking. But anyway, if you're more, if you're interested about a little bit more of our services, onwithlife.org is our website, and the phone number, if you wanted to hear even more after today, is listed on your handout and listed up on the screen. Really what we want to talk about today is a comprehensive program for Parkinson's and we want to talk about why, why it's important to have that, but then also tell you guys about three different intervention strategies related to treating individuals with Parkinson's. So we'll start off with what is it? So uh, James Parkinson in 1870 d discovered that there was this shaky palsy. What was it? He, he termed it to be Parkinson's. Uh, we know that in the US it affects 1.5 million people and um, seems to affect men and women equally, although the risk is a little bit different, but it seems to affect them equally. And we know that most people are about 70, or excuse me, 60 years of age upon diagnosis, but there's about 15% or more that are less than 50. We'll call those our young onset um, Parkinson's disease population. But for some reason, that's also increasing in terms of the early diagnosis. And we also know that there's a higher incidence in actually developed country, countries. So what is it? What causes it? Why? Why does this happen? So we know it's a lack of dopamine. <laughs> dopamine is that chemical messenger that's that relay station so that it helps us with our smooth and very coordinated movements. So um, we don't think about our movements on a day-to-day -day act a day-to-day -day basis, everything is pretty much automatic. So when there's a lack of dopamine um, producing neurons, we know that we have a lot of difficulty with our movement and that, that ultimately the end goal is that we've got to treat that dopamine system the, from a medical standpoint, we've got to treat that system because that is the system that's ruling. We do know that in Parkinson's that there's other chemicals that get disrupted, serotonin, um, norepinephrine, and also acetylcholine, and those all have to do with those additional things, our mood stabilizers, our depression, our cognition, because we also know that cog uh, cognition changes quite a bit as well with people with Parkinson's. And the cholinergic system, so it, that controls our movement, our gait, our balance, our memory, our sleep, all of these things that just encompass the Parkinson's diagnosis in general. So how do we get it? What is the cause? Why? Well, essentially it's, a very, it's quite idiopathic. We don't really know why. 
Truly, it's not like, there's not one thing that you can say, this is it. This is the one thing that has caused Parkinson's. We know there are several uh, genetic factors um, having to do with several genes. Once these genes, they're present, but they can mutate. If they mutate, it increases the risk. Um, but overall, there's not like, again, this magic one gene. Woo, this is the magic ticket. We do know that, the, or at least they think, there's some environmental factors that are associated with um, the risk of Parkinson's. And so if we think about Iowa, the state of Iowa has a lot of pesticides. We have a lot of rural communities as well. And something about the exposure to pesticides and the exposure to certain heavy metals. So I do tell a story of I had a patient who, he'll tell me it's, it's not uncommon that back in the day, as a farmer, your pesticide tube would get clogged, he would undo the tube, blow it out, stick it right back on, and he has Parkinson's. Now, is that meaning that's what happened? It just wasn't uncommon back in the day. Don't know. We also have a gentleman that we work with quite frequently who's worked with heavy metals. Magnesium is one of them, aluminum being another one. And these heavy metals, for some reason, tend to increase that risk of getting Parkinson's. And we also know that repeated head injuries. So if we think of boxing, Muhammad Ali typically is going to pop into your, into your mind first, but we think of repeated head injuries as a cause for uh, Parkinson's as well. Um, oh, but there's no clear, like there's, again, not the magic bullet regarding that. Age, uh, we know that it's a little bit more common, greater than 50. We think that um, men have a greater risk than women do, although it tends to be equal in diagnosis, and Caucasians are more at risk than African Americans and Asians. So there's four main symptoms, four main things that we kind of think about when we look at Parkinson's. And the biggest thing, you need to have two of the four in order to be diagnosed with Parkinson's. And the first one being shaking or the tremor. Um, it is it is present in about 70% of the population, but that doesn't mean that just because you don't have a tremor, you don't have Parkinson's. So often people will go to their physician and they will not have a tremor, but they'll have this other stuff that we'll talk about as well. But they get excluded because they don't have a tremor, but they don't have to have a tremor to be um, considered to have Parkinson's. Usually it's a resting tremor, so when you begin to do something um, intense that tremor goes away and it typically will start in the hand or foot, sometimes both, and usually on one side, not necessarily both sides at the same time. Um, but what's interesting is that the tremor tends to get worse when people are under a lot of stress and fatigue. And so when they come to the clinic and they're, they're there for the first evaluation, there's a lot of stress and anxiety that's related to having this, this evaluation. And so you see a lot more of the symptoms and certainly the um, tremors popping in a lot more. Um, three out of four people have tremor that affects one side of their body, like I said. As the disease progresses, it can go to both sides of the body as well. Um, and usually, like I said, it decreases with intention or when people are sleeping. The other thing that is another big symptom, so we have tremors, we have bradykinesia, which is the slowness of movement. And so with bradykinesia, it's that profound, very, very slow movement. It's the loss of spontaneous automatic movement as well. It's usually pretty frustrating for people. And the, the bradykinesia can just be, I mean, just slowness just in general. That difficulty in terms of modulating their speed, modulating their movement, um, very, very slow activity. But it's not just movement. It also can be slow in your speech as well. Um, so that are two of them. The other one is rigidity. Um, that tends to be one of those... Um, um, yeah, don't know where I was going with that. Strike that one. <laughs> um, from a rigidity standpoint, again, you, you don't have to have tremors, but a lot of people might present being rather rigid. And what you see is just that rigid in the posture, rigid in the shoulders, rigid in the face. Um, but it may be present kind of all over. And then the one really, really big precursor or the big risk or the big um, identifier is postural instability. And that tends to happen. It's that impaired balance system. And it tends to happen um, 
at the later stages. You might have it in, upon initial diagnosis, typically not, but the postural instability, usually upon pull test, you literally pull somebody backwards and they need to be able to maintain their balance. Um, usually that is a sign of the progression of the disease as people go on. We also know there's a lot of other motor symptoms. So those are the four main ones, but we also know there is um, decreased automatic reflexes, such as blinking. So a lot of people with Parkinson's end up having just sort of a large stare. They're not blinking as much as they can, should. Freezing, we have freezing of gait, freezing of your movement, um, literally feeling like you're stuck in place. Loss of facial expression, we sort of talk about a masked face. Um, uh, yep. Uh, <laughs> dysarthria, so slow or low volume and voicing. Oftentimes it's a reduced arm swing, so as somebody's walking, one arm might go, the other one doesn't. Um, Micrographia, really an ability to, to sustain that bigness throughout writing. So you start off writing your name or writing your name on a check and it starts off big with a G and an A and an I and I get to my M and now I've just lost it. And it becomes a little squiggle or it stops. Some people tend to have falling backwards or they festinate. So we get into um, freezing of gait patterns that look like that. Non-motor, so motor's you know, one thing, but the non-motor is this whole host of other garbage that individuals with Parkinson's have to deal with and what we need to know about. Cognitive changes, that is goes hand in hand um, with our people with Parkinson's. Um, it has problems with your attention, your executive functioning, your language, memory skills. It's a big deal. It's a really, really big deal. So not only are you being robbed from your physical mobility, but also cognitively things are changing. Changing. We have a lot of individuals have orthostatic hypotension, so lightheadedness drops in that blood pressure tends to be really difficult. Impulse control disorders, some of the medications can actually cause individuals to, to um, have more compulsive behavior. So red flag, if you ever have somebody who's just recently started a med and they talk about compulsive gambling or their partner is like, wow, they are being really over-sexual or they're just doing compulsive kinds of things, it might be the medication, but it also can be in those later stages of the disease process as well. And just a whole host of physical changes, weight loss, um, oily skin, dandruff, vision changes, um, loss of sense of smell is a huge one, and that one's kind of interesting because a lot of individuals, initially with loss of sense of smell, um, it might happen 20 years, it's a prodromal one, it might happen 20 years before they actually get diagnosed with Parkinson's. And so in our clinic, we will often say, do you still have your sense of smell? And <laughs> nine times out of 10, nope. I haven't had that in a very, very long time. And we'll start asking questions about how long ago that was. And it's a long time from the period of diagnosis. Pain, mood disorders, um, anxiety, depression, huge, huge in the our Parkinson's population. And it's definitely one of those things that we need to not overlook. There's GI issues, constipation seems to be one of those big ones that's, that's really difficult. Sleep disorders, oftentimes we have REM sleep disorders and sometimes their spouses are known to punch, kick, thrash out in the middle of the night. Um, urinary incontinence is a big deal too. Um, for some reason, melanoma, I don't really know why on that one, but I'll just tell you. I don't know. Um, and sexual concerns, changes in sexual desire or that other end of being hypersexual and a little bit more um, active, as we say. Um, so motor fluctuations. So some things to think about that are other issues regarding our, our Parkinson's individuals is we have motor fluctuations and there we have dyskinesia. So I've got Michael J. Fox up there. Most individuals, if I were to say, do what Michael J. Fox does, we would probably all be writhing. So if you've seen him like on TV or he's talking about his Parkinson's, he's writhing a lot. Um, that's a dyskinesia. It tends to happen toward those later stages of diagnosis.
diagnosis. And um, sometimes it is related to long-standing use of carbidopa levodopa, which is that drug that we need to use to be able to get people to move. Um, but it can have those adverse effects. Sometimes we've asked our individuals when they've come to us for therapy to... They, there's a sensory mismatch. They think that they're, you know, wiggling and, and they're, they're able to move well. And we know that if we actually back them off a little bit and treat them um, when they're not so wiggly, they have better postural stability and better movement, which is kind of interesting. Has to do with those on-off times. Um, and then we have individuals who have dystonia. So you might hear of people talking about their feet cramping or their hands cramping or they've got orthopedic changes. So this individual on um, Pitchard has Pisa syndrome, which is um, the leaning tower of Pisa, because of the dystonia, it pulls so hard on one side, that muscular unilateral side, it ends up making orthopedic changes with these individuals. And then now where there's a zig, there's a zag. It's totally thrown off all of their um, you know, postural control as well, and then all sorts of pain related to it. So we have, um, there's been, di you know, been, um, classified five stages of Parkinson's through the Hone and Yar scale. So you might get PTs in your eval, you might get the H and Y something. So somebody in your, you know, H and P might say that it's the H and Y three. What does it mean? Um, stage zero is there is no signs of the disease. Stage one, typically there's a unilateral. Something has begun to happen. The arm's not swinging. It might be tremulous. You might get the pill rolling. Something's occurring. Um, stage 1.5, you have that unilateral, but now you've got a little bit of axial involvement going on as well. Stage 2, bilateral, um, but you, you're not losing your balance. So you've become more rigid, something's occurring, um, you're not losing your balance, so you're okay there. Now, um, stage 2.5, we're bilateral, but as I do a pull test, you can still recover. But it's getting to the point where it's not necessarily great postural stability. Stage three, mild to moderate disease. So now we might be more in that middle stage of diseases, some postural instability, and you need some physical, and you're still physically independent. Four, severe disability, but you can still walk. So that's when we're probably using some devices, our um, U step, a rollator, something like that. And stage five would be wheelchair bound or bedridden. Okay, if we, at, at On With Life, so since treating our people since 2013, we've really tried to think about like the book of Parkinson's. So we know there's all of these stages, early, middle, late. And what's super important is to be able to provide services from that entire spectrum. Um, so when we think of Parkinson's, we want to think of it like a book. And that if, if that each chapter is one of those stages, once that chapter ends, we need to get something else going so that we need to be the provider or we need to provide services as all of us provide services through that journey, through that book of Parkinson's. So at All With Life, um, we've created, like we really want to invest in this. So we've created what our mission is, is that we are going to um, help people with Parkinson's to live large. Live large with the Parkinson's disease. That's what's most important. And by creating that, what we're thinking is, what does living large mean? It means L, a lifelong continu continuum of care. A, we want to inspire to empower individuals with PD. That's what we need to do. Your life is not over. Your quality of life may feel like it's gotten small, but we have to aspire people to empower them to continue to living really good quality of life. R is for rehab, so that we know that we want to do rehab within a transdisciplinary team, um, making sure that we're the experts in that, in that um, providing of rehab. We want to guide um, our person served through this evidence-based approach. We want to get, be able to apply, <laughs> hello? No. We want to be able to apply evidence-based programming, and we also want to educate, create a community base, create a support group for all of our individuals living with Parkinson's. So what we did is we created domains 
And why we created these domains was in an effort to look at the entire spectrum of Parkinson's. And I'll talk about those domains in just a second. But it basically guides us and it it guides us in the programming and what we need to provide people with Parkinson's and also their care partners across the whole spectrum. And basically what it does for us is it, it helps us get consistency of care. So it doesn't matter if I see them or if somebody else sees them or you see them or whoever, that it's a consistent care throughout. This is why we created these domains. So very briefly, just to say what they are, as care providers, we need to be looking at every single one of these domains in regard to early, middle, late stages and how they, how they change, what are we gonna do? So the first one being physical, that's probably the, big, you know, the biggest thing that we always see is that physical stuff. But we also know there's deficits in communication, so that is your dysarthric, um, you, know, you're, you have low voluming, your people can't hear you, so communication's a big deal. Dysphagia and nutrition, we know swallowing gets messed up. When people aren't able to swallow, one, they lose weight, two, they might get aspiration pneumonia, so we really need to pay attention to that one as well. Bigger issues like psychosocial. Again, I sort of talked about quality of life, but so often what we see with a diagnosis is that people's quality of life gets smaller and smaller and smaller. They don't go to church. They're not going out to dinner. They're not going to the movies because everything is too difficult. So the world gets smaller, so it's important to be able to affect that psychosocial. Cognitive, being able to do your own bills, being able to, um, you know, basically... Hum <laughs> we. Cognition's darn important. <laughs> That's all I got to say about that. Then there's all that medical garbage that goes along with it too, the, the hypotension, the urinary issues. I mean, anything that you can think of from a medical standpoint that needs to also be addressed. Community, support, uh, support for your care partner, and again, that quality of life. Really making sure that what is being put into place and what we're providing is helping people get a bigger, and sustaining that quality of life. Okay, now I'm going to pass it over to Sue. Hi, I'm Sue. I'm the occupational therapist that works in outpatient at On With Life. And one of the interventions that is uh, that we use is LSVT. Um, sometimes I think we should have... Courtney do this because LSVT actually stands for Lee Silverman Voice Training. So um, it actually was developed um, by a speech therapist who was working, I always call her lovely Lee Silverman, because she had Parkinson's disease and her family just and herself were like, if, we, if only we could hear and understand her. And so um, Lee Silverman and her family um, worked with Lorraine Ramig, who is a, and um, Carolyn bon, Bonatati, we're going to go with that, um, who, are speech, who are speech therapists. And so um, that is how LSVT was first created. And so um, some of the ways that uh, Parkinson's disease can be treated um, and how it fits in with these different treatments is through voice and body exercises. Um, so in addition to voice and body exercises, there's pharmacological treatments and neurosurgical treatments such as DBS. Um, at On With Life, um, we are currently focusing um, for LSVT on the voice and body exercise. So LSVT Big came about because you know, physical therapist who I love said, hey, that Lee Silverman voice treatment is working quite well. I wonder if there is a possibility that we could also train movements to be bigger. Um, so it is a, an intensive amplitude-based exercise program for the limb motor system. And we're also looking at re-educating the sensory motor system. And like I stated, it's based off of the loud principles. 
And it consists of a standardized exercise protocol that is com uh, completed over a four-week period, and we meet with the individuals four times a week for an hour each session. Um, and it's administered um, in an intensive manner so that we can really uh, get as big a bang for our buck, what I tell the person served that we worked with, um, to really drive the change in their sensory motor system. Um, and these um, techniques are specifically related to counteract the motor deficits that can occur with uh, PD-specific issues, such as the slowness of movement, the kinesthetic awareness, and such. Do I press the thing? Hi. <laughs> So this is a, a video of a gentleman um, who pre and post um, LSVT on how his walking is looking. So on the left side of your screen is how he looked with his walking prior to participating in the LSVT big program. Four weeks later, you can see he's probably done with the program because he's walking really big and quite quickly out to his car. Well, he just keeps going and going. And this is after four weeks of the LSVT protocol. And so you can see from the side that his step length is much bigger and it also looks more normal. And so he probably feels like he's taking big steps. And what we are helping train people to do is to overemphasize their movements so they actually are moving with normal movement patterns. So see, in the first one, he's like, I got my evaluation. I'm ready to go. And then when he's done, he is just ready to keep going. All righty, so LSVT big concepts are standardized um, and research-based, and we follow a specific protocol. So the target of LSVT big is amplitude or big movements, and the mode in which we uh, uh, drive these big movements is through intensive high effort. And what we are looking for is for the person to be able to generalize these big movements into their daily lives by being able to sense when they're starting to move, fall, move smaller and go, oh, I need to be bigger and then make their own corrections. So again, we're targeting big movements, and not just with walking, but we're also looking at big hands, <laughs> big posture, because I am the posture police, by the way. Um, and we, so um, we are looking to help the person override their uh, perception of how they are moving. And through this, we're also increasing their range of motion, we're increasing their speed and their uh, distance of how far they're able to go, um, and how they're able to uh, cue themselves. So at any time throughout their day, the ultimate goal is that we can, after this four weeks, they can take it over themselves and um, uh, make themselves bigger and move more normal. So basically, we're trying to help them change their internal uh, feeling and perception of how they're moving. So you can see on the bottom there, a, a participant in LSVT, big, kind of drew a picture of himself of how he felt um, before the program and then after he completed the program. So there was a real change in how he perceived and felt about himself. Um, so here is um, 
one example of Miss Gail um, with one of our persons served. So not only does moving big help people move more efficiently, it can also help them move faster because they're not moving so small and slowly. And then we also have people that have been through our program who say, you know what, when I'm even away from home, I'm also going to practice and practice and practice being big. So they send us pictures of on vacation, you can also be big and still need to be big. So one of the uh, ways, or excuse me, in addition to um, LSVT, uh, another mode of uh, physical treatment for a person served with uh, Parkinson's is exercise. So um, aerobic exercise is good for everybody. And the guidelines state 30 minutes a day, five days a week, moderate intensity. This, not only for people without Parkinson's disease, people with Parkinson's disease need to make sure that they are maintaining their cardiovascular and their aerobic health. Also, strengthening programs are very beneficial for folks with Parkinson's disease. Again, two two days per week, um, 10 to 15 reps of the motions. Um, when you, if you are a person or a therapist or an exercise person who is working with a person with Parkinson's, it's good to consider uh, working on the extensor movements. So if you have somebody come in and their, their posture is bent over, working on some maybe reverse flies, some rows to help with those external, or excuse me, extensor musculature. Stretching is also very important because if a person with Parkinson's has some of the rigidity, stretching can help relieve some of the the soreness and tightness and balance training. So if a person has with Parkinson's has just found out that they have Parkinson's disease starting early with balance training is very is beneficial. So there are exercise and wellness programs that have been developed specifically for persons with Parkinson's disease. Uh, so there are some that um, as you see on this slide, that are specific for Parkinson's disease and then others that are, can be beneficial for Parkinson's disease that weren't specifically developed for folks with Parkinson's but have been found to be beneficial. So um, I talked about the LSVT Big and uh, Courtney will be talking about loud. There's also a program called Big for Life. Uh, there's dance programs for folks with Parkinson's. Delay the disease, you may have heard of that. That is, um, I know in the Des Moines area that there's several uh, groups with that. Uh, PWR stands for power. Uh, rock steady boxing has uh, come on nice and strong. Um, and then there's also some online or virtual um, exercise um, options for folks. Um, some non specific PD interventions could be Tai Chi, yoga, water aerobics, Zumba, silver sneakers programs, walking, uh, and cycling. And so now I'm going to uh, hand it over to Courtney, who is our speech therapist, to talk to you T loud. All right. So we mentioned that we're kind of doing this backwards. So the joke is, is that um, it's all about Gail and on with life. So that's why we covered the PT stuff first. But um, honestly, when it comes to talking about LSVT, um, you know, the more that I do this, um, the more that I realize that it actually makes more sense to talk about the rationale of loud when we've talked about the big first. And so um, one of the things that I also want to add with the development of LSVT loud that, you know, it was 
based out of you know frustration of a person with Parkinson's that could no longer be heard. But also, this was developed out of the frustration that traditional therapy wasn't working. And that meant that you could take a person with Parkinson's and within that clinic room, you could get them to be louder, you could get them to be better understood, but as soon as that person walked out of the room, they were right back to being small. So this program also really um, addresses um, what we call the sensory mismatch. So that idea that your brain does not give you accurate feedback about your movement patterns or your voice. So a person with Parkinson's from a voice standpoint, they tend to say, you know what? People are constantly asking me to repeat and I don't know why I sound just fine. It's everybody else around me who can't hear me. They need a hearing aid. So um, as I said, this program, which is based on the principles of high intensity, high level of effort, multiple repetitions, really drives those changes in the brain to retrain a person's sensory system to recognize when they're using a voice that can no longer be heard. So the protocol is very, very similar to the big protocol in which we see people for individual treatment sessions over a four week period for four times a week. And there are a set of core exercises that we do with our patients each time that we see them. We do them the same way in the, the, every time. And then we have a specific hierarchy of tasks to then carry over that vocal loudness into reading, into speech, and then the generalization component. How do we help them then carry over that loud speech to outside of the clinic? All right, so um, LSVT loud is an amplitude-based treatment. We are trying to get those muscles to move with better range of motion, and we are trying to get those muscles to move with more deliberation, with more gusto. And so with that intensive treatment, we always ask people to put forth a high level of effort. So on a 10-point rating scale, how hard are you working? We want that number to be eight, between an 8 and 10 for every exercise. And um, as I said, you know, there's that generalization standpoint. So with multiple repetitions, they're getting that muscle memory, they're improving that range of motion, their voice is getting louder. Then we take a look at the internal cueing, which if you notice, there's two simple words here for LSVT. There's big and there's loud. And the thing is, is that when we were taking people through this treatment protocol, we don't spend a whole lot of time yapping at them. It's think big, 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 because it's a global variable. When you think big, it's head to toe bigness. When you think loud, it's everything from taking that deep breath in all the way up through facial expression. So we don't do a lot of very minuscule cueing. It's that one word. It's big, 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 or loud, loud, loud. And that's something that then can be more easily carried over outside of the clinic because they can think to themselves, think big, big. Oh, I'm going to talk. I need to be loud. And then start speaking with that louder voice. Um, so... As I said, the same with big. So with loud, the protocol, it is going to increase the range of motion of the muscles that are used in voice and speech. And what we know now is that this program has been around so long and there's very sound research to support it, is now we're also starting to see research connecting the use of this protocol to improved swallowing. So again, when we take a look at the incidence of dysphagia, in our persons with Parkinson's, anything that we can do from an early intervention standpoint to mitigate complications related to swallowing, we want to be incorporating that. So I'm now going to show you this sweet lady. I, I think this is just textbook what loud does. Any changes in your speech or your voice? Yes, I don't speak loud enough a lot of times. Anything else? Of course. Uh-huh. Anything else? I stutter, which I never did before. 
Do this for me if you would. Take a deep breath and say ah for as long as you can. Ah. Good for you. Okay. Would you say Parkinson's disease has caused you to talk less? Yes. Because? Because I stutter and then I can't be heard. If there's noise in the house, like when the kids come over, nobody pays attention to me because they can't hear me. Until I get mad and then yell. Take a deep breath and say ah for as long as you can. changes in your speech or your voice as a result of the speech therapy? Oh, yes. What have you noticed? I talk louder. I think louder. <laughs> I'm going to sing with the Sons of the Sons of Pioneers one of these days with my, my voice. <laughs> Good for you. That's excellent. Uh, what practicing do you do at home? My ahs, my highs, and my lows. And I read out the, uh, the mail out loud. Do you feel like practicing helps? Oh, yes. Okay. Um, do you feel as though people can understand you all of the time now? Majority of the time, unless it's my husband, and he'll say, what? I can't hear you. <laughs> Good for you. But I think he does that just to be cute. I think he does, too. <laughs> Has anyone commented that it's easier to understand you now? Oh, yes. I set some of our friends back when we went to their house, and I talked about Lou says, what the hell happened to you? <laughs> <laughs> My daughter said, oh, Ma, that's you? <laughs> Isn't that good? Don't you feel wonderful? Oh, yeah, because now she can't say, I didn't understand what you said. Right. No excuses, right? Yeah, that's no right. excuses. All right. So what do you do when you want to be as easy to understand as possible? Think loud. So I think I've also called this video boatloads of sass in four weeks. <laughs> but you see, too, there's also, you know, there's not just the, about making a voice louder. It's about being able to engage socially, once again, being able to reestablish those relationships with friends and family. So you heard her say at the very beginning, you know, she just sits there because nobody can understand her, so she doesn't bother talking. Where at the end, she is fully engaged in her social life again. So for the last couple of minutes, um, I want to talk a little bit about cognition. Um, Gail did a wonderful job of saying cognition is a big deal. And um, this is something that I personally take um, passion in doing because I do think that um, while we are knowing a lot more about the cognitive changes that happen with Parkinson's, I still think that um, the changes that are happening are still largely going unrecognized. So um, when I started providing LSVT loud treatment back in 2013, 2014, um, when we talked about cognitive changes, the statistic that was being thrown out there was about 50% of people with Parkinson's will experience some sort of cognitive change with disease progression. And that has since been revised to about 80%. Um, and so what that generally presents as, as Gail said, um, changes in attention, changes in short-term memory, changes in word finding, changes in problem solving. And um, also, you know, when we talk about bradykinesia and that slowness of movement, we also see that in cognition too called bradyphrenia, which is a slowness of thought. Um, so those cognitive changes can present as a mild cognitive impairment for folks with Parkinson's. For a small percentage of people with Parkinson's, that mild cognitive impairment could be a precursor to a Parkinson's-related dementia. So when we take a look at supporting cognition in people with Parkinson's, so we know that there's plenty of research out there that links positive mood, physical exercise, and cognition. So when I talk to people about optimal cognition, 
one of the first things that I'm talking about is where are they from a mood standpoint? Where are they from an exercise standpoint? Because those are things that we know are going to put the brain in a better position to function optimally. And then when we take a look at the dementia research, we also know that some sort of daily cognitive stimulation may postpone cognitive changes that eventually lead to a dementia diagnosis, so delaying the onset of symptoms. And there's still research going on about does that cognitive stimulation actually slow progression? And so when we talk about cognitive stimulation, um, these are the things that we think about um, when we're doing a crossword puzzle or we're doing a word find. Um, so something that is novel to the brain just to get it doing some thinking. Um, also, some other activities that fall under the realm of cognitive stimulation. So just trying something that's new and out of routine. That is something that is going to stimulate the brain. Um, working outside of a routine. We, we say brains like routine. Routine is good from a memory and attention support standpoint. But once in a while, kind of we, we call it the go big or go home principle, trying something new and out of the box is something that is also beneficial for our cognition. And remaining socially engaged. The more that we are able to remain socially, in a social relationship with friends and family, the better our cognition is supported. So um, also when we think about ways to support cognition, we can also think about, um, for some folks, doing specific cognitive training. So this is the use of a specific strategy to help them overcome an area of impairment. So um, a lot of what I do when I am working with cognition is what kind of support, so like planners, calendars, alarms, can help somebody who has a memory impairment. And then cognitive rehabilitation is that individualized skilled therapy where the overall purpose is to improve overall function in both ADLs and as well as overall quality of life. So that usually ends up being a combination of introducing kind of those cognitive stimulation exercise-based activities along with training or use of compensatory strategies. So in the last three minutes, I'll just wrap up um, with a little bit about wellness. Again, when we think about how do we carry over what we provide in the clinic to everyday life, um, we've been taking um, a much closer look at what kinds of wellness options are available. What can we provide as well as um, how do we partner with people in our community to make sure that our people with Parkinson's are continuing to get those services to help them maintain and optimize their physical function and their cognition. So um, a couple of things that we have, for example, um, we do a monthly support group um, for people that have done LSVT. So they go through the exercises, it's kind of a refresher, therapists can then kind of keep an eye on people, make any um, changes if you know there's an exercise that they're not quite doing correctly and provide that real-time feedback. And then we also um, have a second support group that is more of an education based support group. And this has been extremely well received to the point that we're looking at offering it two times a month starting in the new year. So um, again, education topics specific to Parkinson's um, and not just for people with Parkinson's, but also for care partners as well, which is extremely important in this journey. Um, we have also... Um, over the last couple of years, um, we have done a lot of boxing with our people with Parkinson's and also um, more recently have introduced um, a cognitive fitness group. So again, you know, in a social setting, um, introducing different activities to people with Parkinson's as well as their, their care partners are welcome to join us too. And just helping them to go through different tasks and give them ideas for ways that they can then incorporate cognitive stimulation into their daily lives. So some more awesome pictures of our awesome folks that we work with. And um, in your handouts, um, we just have a list of resources um, at both the, the state and the national levels, um, just really good resources for people with Parkinson's and their care partners. All right, so that concludes our presentation and we would be happy to take any questions.
In, in the last video, two questions. In the last video, were any medication changes given to that patient between before and after? Second part of the question is, uh, your program um, with, with thinking of Parkinsonism and energy ex calorie expenditure, uh, do you see any um, uh, appetite or weight changes as part of the program? So um, I will address the first part of that question, which I honestly have had the exact same question as I'm watching the pre and post videos, not just for the, the big, but for the loud too. Were any adjustments made to medications? We don't know. It's a possibility, um, but um, I can also say from our clinical experience that the people that we work with, um, you know, sometimes there are people that come in and they're really struggling. And part of it is, is that we need to refer them back to their movement disorder specialist to see if there is an adjustment in their medications that needs to be taken. Um, but that being said, we also have plenty of people that are showing very similar results without any adjustments to their medication regimen. So, I don't know if this is going. And to add on to that, one of the things that we did not mention um, with the program, we do pre and post testing. And most of our people don't have medication changes with that pre and post testing. And usually there's anywhere between a 20 and 40% improvement in the pre and the post testing. So what you did see with that lovely little lady and what you did see with the, with the individual walking is tr truly what we see, um, 20 to 40%. So I always say to people, if you were to give me a thousand dollars and I could guarantee in four weeks that I could give you a 20 to 40% return, you'd take me up on it. And it really does make that much of a pr profound difference. In regard to the appetite and weight loss, so that's kind of funny. So sometimes with the quality of life, people end up going out to eat more. So they've told us that they're gaining weight because they're eating at restaurants more. Um, in terms of appetite, I, I wouldn't be able to say one way or the other. In terms of weight loss or appetite, they seem to just, um, it seems to be status quo from what, from what we see. I just wanted to mention as far as like weight loss and appetite is the folks that we have been working with um, over the past, has it been seven years? Six years since we started LSVT Big and Loud. Um, the folks that have um, progressed in the disease process is where we are seeing more of the changes in the appetite and weight than during the LSVT big and loud programs. Um, in recent years, LSVT Global has been kind of marketing LSVT Big and Loud for use with other neurological disorders other than just Parkinson's disease, like stroke or MS, even in pediatric populations. Do you guys do LSVT Big and Loud with, with other populations? Um, I have incorporated quite a few of the concepts with the person serve that I work with. Um, not only some of the exercise um, but uh, postural control. And also, um, I would say with the cueing, uh, to be less wordy and to give more simple cueing and modeling. And I would say that I've used it with all sorts of populations that we see it on with life. And more so, from my PT brain, I think of some of the exercises are things like stepping out and coming back in. Well, that's balance. Um, stepping backwards and being able to maintain where you were. So if we're firing most of the extensors, which is a lot of the target, but to also be able to sustain the muscle control and the muscle movement, I've used it a lot with a lot of different populations. Um, the exercises are great. There's eight of them. They're consistent. They're awesome. And they really make you work hard. So I don't think it matters what population it is. So um, on the speech therapy side, um, I have not used the formal protocol with other diagnoses, but much like Gail and Sue said, um, I've definitely incorporated those concepts, um, not just for folks with stroke and brain injury, but also um, cerebral palsy. We work with a number of adults with CP that have definitely benefited from the loudness because of the, the respiration component, trying to get that good quality breath in.
Awesome. Thank you. And I have a second question. Um, your monthly support groups seem a lot like the Big for Life program. Is it an actual Big for Life program or just using a lot of the similar concepts of having patients that have already gone through the four-week program for maintenance classes? Um, it's not formally a big for life. So we always do the exercises because that is the check-in to make sure that the people have that accountability. Um, and then we usually do sh a throw in some sort of activity component. But what a lot of our individuals, if they only come to that, they actually want support um, component. So there's a lot of education and just in general support. They would prefer not to do some of the other activity. They want to do the exercises and then support and share. Awesome. Thank you. Uh -huh. uh, do most insurance uh, uh, plans cover your services and uh, what um, arrangements do you make for individuals who are more indigent and may not have um, coverage? I can answer the first part. The second part, maybe not so well, but insurance covers LSVT, big and loud. Uh, actually, the way that we do it at On With Life in terms of our big is that we split it between PT and OT. So you might see PT Monday, Wednesday. You see OT Tuesday, Thursday. We're actually getting the entire body by um, really not just focusing on that one you know, bit. Um, and it's covered by most insurances. We had a bit of trouble with Coventry for a while, but they've gotten a bit better. Um, in terms of um, at On With Life, we do have some, we have a foundation and that foundation does um, help with financial situations um, as much as possible. So that's a route that some of our persons served have gone. But insurance does pay for big and loud because it's therapy. And I would say too, um, and again, from a speech therapy perspective, LSVT Loud, when you take a look at speech pathology interventions, LSVT Loud probably has the most robust evidence base. So generally, we do not have a problem getting it covered. Um, to talk a little bit about access to services, because it's not just financial access, sometimes it's geographic access. We have people that are traveling a long ways for our services, might not be able to do that four days a week. So one of the things that we do work with our person served and their care partners about too is, you know, is there a way to, again, you know, it's not a formal LSVT program, but we're still training those concepts going with a reduced frequency. So we do work for, to we, we want that individualized program that's going to be accessible to our person served and their, their care partners and for them to be able to, to make the maximal use out of it. And we talked a lot about big and loud, but um, you know, when you think of the later stages of Parkinson's, big is not big is not really an option in terms of the movement but the concept is still the same so throughout our approach from early all the way through late stages we talk about being big and what big means and we talk about being loud and what loud means through all the stages even though somebody might not be able to perform the exercises maybe they have to do them in supine maybe they only do a variety of them but it's still that large amplitude from loud and from big is constantly running through our treatment approach. Thank you for a great presentation. And just to follow up on the accessibility, I wanted to note that we do, Mary Greeley has a PT and some speech providers who are certified in the uh, big and loud uh, program. So, um, and then my original question was how strict were you on the four times a week, but you've uh, answered that already. So, but thanks for coming. Quite strict. So they either were in the program or they were not. So, it, but it's okay. We would do traditional, but you just can't call it LSVT big and loud, but you can still say, you can still document that you're using large amplitude concepts or large amplitude treatments, but you can't use the word big or loud to say that that's what you're truly doing. Awesome. Thanks guys.